Hello, my name is Andrew Gary, and welcome to Seismic Sound Off in depth conversations in applied geophysics. In this episode, Mark Zoback discusses his honorary lecture, Geomechanical Issues Affecting Long Term Storage of CO2. In this episode, Mark highlights how oil and gas companies are best positioned to address the needs for large scale carbon storage. He discusses the role of depleted oil and gas reservoirs for CO2 storage, as well as the geomechanical issues that have to be considered. Mark also shares what is most essential to unlocking long-term CO2 storage and how government officials and companies can work together. This is a timely conversation that addresses real-world needs with the geophysical knowledge to solve problems. Visit seg.org slash podcast for the link to listen to Mark's lecture. This episode is brought to you by CGG. Question, what is key to safe, long-term CO2 storage? Answer, a good understanding of subsurface site integrity. Making more informed decisions while developing your subsurface storage calls for the kind of integrated geoscience expertise CGG can provide. Its multidisciplined approach delivers assessments of containment risks such as cap rock failure, fault reactivation, and surface deformation. Its coupled reservoir, geomechanics, and fracturing simulations can incorporate thermal effects and a full range of nonlinear material models to ensure a rigorous assessment of injection and storage risks. With CGG, gain greater insight for your carbon and energy storage projects with its unique range of geoscience expertise that helps you see things differently. Now for our conversation. All right, well, Mark, I am excited to speak with you today. Your honorary lecture is called Geomechanical Issues Affecting Long-Term Storage of CO2. Why is now the right time to be discussing the long-term storage of CO2? Carbon storage has long been recognized as uh, an important tool in limiting uh, greenhouse gas emissions and you know, reducing the impacts of CO2 methane on global warming and climate change. What's happened more recently is a number of studies have been carried out, which are sort of pathways to decarbonization, pathways to net zero. Uh, you know, different groups have undertaken these uh, these studies, and in each and every case, carbon storage in the subsurface at an extremely large scale is a key component of strategies. In other words. You know, we have to do everything we can. We're going to decarbonize the light duty transportation by electrifying cars and small trucks. We're going to be working on energy efficiency. We're going to be switching from coal to natural gas. We're going to be doing a, you know, huge outbuild of wind and solar and, you know, all sorts of things. But carbon storage in the subsurface actually makes carbon in the atmosphere go down it's a negative what's called a negative emission technology and it's a big big component of uh, all of these uh, strategies for decarbonization pathways to net zero whatever you want to call them well speaking of the issues affecting long-term stores that you're going to talk about in this lecture in, in storing CO2 long-term, why is it important to identify potentially active faults? Well, faults are important because they're of two reasons. One is they're potential leakage pathways. Uh, we have to keep the carbon in the subsurface for a few hundred years at, you know, as a minimum. And therefore, uh, you know, finding geologic formations which have good seals, and good seals mean no leakage pathways. And the, the obvious geologic leakage pathways is pre-existing faults, which can allow the CO2 to come upward, or uh, the pressure associated with the injection to go to go both upward and downward. And, and this is potentially problematic. So faults are potential leakage pathways, and that's one. The other, of course, is that we don't want to induce seismicity when the pressure increases as a result of the CO2 injection. So fault identification, you know, is an important part of site characterization. Is it these leakage pathways that make it important, that makes it matter for active faults that are permeable? Yeah, that's right. Not all faults are problematic. It's the faults that are active today in a sort of a geologic sense. Um, I mean, you know, in an intraplate area, 
a fault might produce an earthquake every 10,000 years, every 100,000 years, and it, it's active geologically. But, you know, since uh, rocks in the uh, that we're, we talk about are, are often hundreds of millions of years old, the basement rocks are billions of years old, uh, there are a lot of fractures and faults uh, that have been introduced in the past, which are not active today, and they are not potentially permeable, and they are uh, basically inconsequential. So we not only have to identify faults, but we have to discriminate between those that are potentially problematic and those that are not. Why are depleted oil and gas reservoirs a good place to store CO2? There are basically three reasons uh, why depleted oil and gas reservoirs are good. Two are sort of geologic, and and one is more of a, a social and political issue. From a geologic perspective, the pressure in a depleted oil and gas reservoir is, you know, is has been lowered by the oil production. So if you start to inject CO2, then the pressure is already brought down. And so you have sort of a, a, a window in which pressure can increase and still be well below the initial pressures. So there's, a, there's less of a likelihood of triggering seismicity than there would be, say, a, a saline aquifer that's just above or below the oil producing region, which is still at the initial pressure, which still might be critically stressed, and where you know a small change in pressure might induce seismicity. So that's one concern. The second is that depleted oil and gas reservoirs, the volume of the Earth's crust in which they reside has been well characterized during the oil production process. In other words, seismic data, Wells have been drilled, logs have been run. And so we know a lot about this volume of rock and not only the depleted oil and gas reservoirs, but the adjacent uh, saline aquifers. So in these volumes of rock in which de- depleted aquifers are, you know, uh, exist, we know a lot about the depleted aquifers. Obviously, there was an economic incentive to know as much about them as possible. And we even know about the adjacent formations, which is which is really good. The third reason is that these are already industrial complexes. In other words, you know, there are areas where which have been permitted and used for extraction of hydrocarbons. So you're not going into, you know, a a pristine area where very little has been done, very little is known, and you know, a permitting process has to be undertaken sort of from scratch to make sure not only is the uh, are the geologic and you know engineering considerations um, appropriate for for carbon storage, but it's going to be societally acceptable. You know, it's it's not interfering with use of the land. Uh, you know, by by people or by wildlife. Um, it's not in proximity to you know population centers or um, you know vulnerable ecosystems, and so oil and gas reservoirs, uh, depleted oil and gas reservoirs you know, have a lot of advantages, both prior knowledge, the existing pore pressure, and um, I think they're more societally acceptable because of the activity that's gone on in the past than it would be a totally pristine area where where, where nothing has been done uh, similarly uh, in the past. Yeah, it's such a great way to be able to reuse information that you've been able to gather over the years and, and use it in this new way without having to kind of rebuild the same thing. How how might the injection of CO2 impact these depleted oil and gas reservoirs, though? Well, that's a very important issue. In my honorary lecture, I don't talk about it very much. But, you know, when you produce the oil and gas and lower the pressure, um, the reservoir undergoes what's called a stress path. The stress path is how the stresses and the pore pressure have changed as a function of time. Now, if the pore pressure is depletes enough, depending on the you know makeup of the formation, there can also be compaction, porosity loss, permeability loss. You know, there are also changes to the reservoir. So when you start injecting, you have to understand what the initial conditions of the reservoir were before depletion started, how the change in pressure and how the change in stress have evolved over time. And how the material, how the reservoir materials have changed, you know, have the, has there been appreciable compaction? Has there been porosity loss? Has there been permeability loss? But when you know all this, then you're in a position to, you know, carry out modeling 
uh, and try to find you know, CO2 injection strategies that are optimal for the conditions at which you start. And so when you start increasing the pressure, you want to know uh, exactly what path that's going to take, how pressure and stress will evolve, where, how many wells you need, at what rate can you successfully um, inject. In other words, you don't want to have too few wells and generate very high pressures around those injection wells. It's much better to uh, spread out the injection into multiple wells to raise the pressure more slowly. And all that's fine, but you know, to carry out the modeling you need to come up with these optimal strategies, we, we need to know, you know where the reservoir started and how the reservoir evolved, both in a physical property sense and in, in terms of uh, poor pressure and, and stress. Why, why is it necessary for these reservoirs to include both a top seal and a bottom seal? Well, the top seal is obvious. The CO2 is buoyant. Um, CO2 has a density, and it's a, you know, we know it as a gas, um, of course, but in res under reservoir conditions, it's called a supercritical fluid. Um, literally, it is neither a liquid or a gas, but it's a lot more like a, a liquid in the reservoir. Its density is about 60% that of water. So we, we can talk about, you know, a volume under reservoir conditions and when you inject the volume, that CO2, say it's into a water-filled formation, that CO2 is going to naturally try to rise to the top. And so you need a top seal to keep CO2 from, from rising up further. The bottom seal is a little bit more subtle, and that is related to things we've learned studying injection, um, water injection uh, related to uh, injection-induced seismicity. When you inject into a reservoir that is sitting right on top of crystalline basement, and examples of this are the Ellenberger Formation in the Fort Worth Basin, the uh, Arbuckle Formation uh, in Oklahoma, the Mount Simon uh, Formation in Illinois, the Ozark Aquifer in Arkansas, all of these are places where injection into a, this basal sedimentary unit transmitted pressure down into the basement rocks and generated seismicity uh, you know, below the injection zone in these hard crystalline rocks and pre-existing faults that exist in them. And so you don't want that to happen, obviously. Um, and, and there are a couple of reasons. One, you know, a worst case scenario is, you know, the induced earthquakes could threaten the seal of, of the CO2 uh, storage unit. But also, even small earthquakes uh, tells the public or could tell the public, you know, that, you know, CO2 storage is a hazardous activity. And as a hazardous activity, you know, they're going to be uh, opposing it. And uh, we've seen this in, uh, you know, small earthquakes shutting down um, natural gas production in the Groningen field in the Netherlands. We've seen very small earthquakes in the uh, Midlands of the United Kingdom uh, stop uh, shale gas development. So the public is very attuned to this. And so we need a bottom seal to make sure pressures are not transmitted deep into these deeper uh, crystalline rock environments uh, where they could trigger, trigger seismicity. Uh, and Again, even small earthquakes are potentially problematic. A bottom seal will will prevent that from happening. Are there enough of these depleted oil and gas reservoirs to store CO2 to reach net zero emission goals? I think there is if you look globally. Um, and of course, one of the challenges of large scale uh, carbon storage, you know, is connecting sources where you can collect the CO2 from uh, a point source and sinks where you're going to inject it, whether into a depleted oil and gas reservoir or a, a saline aquifer. But you know we've been producing oil at a tremendous rate uh, for you know 100 years or so, and uh, we've created a lot of depleted reservoirs. And so globally, there's a tremendous inventory of pore, uh, you know, available pore space. Now, they have to be carefully characterized. They have to be characterized from a geologic perspective. They have to be characterized from an engineering perspective, and they have to be characterized geomechanically. But the potential is there. And, and on a global basis, um, they, uh, you know, they're, they're certainly adequate capacity, but they're not all going to be located in, in ideal places. So 
we have to get started here and let's get started on the, the places where the sources and sinks are close together with the reservoirs that are the pre reservoirs that are uh, most well known to us the least likely to induce seismicity we really have to get this process started at scale uh, when you look at where we are now and when you look at where all of these studies i referred to earlier uh, expect us to be you know storing a gigaton of of, of CO2 by uh, 2030, uh, six gigatons of CO2 by 2050. These are IEA estimates. Uh, right now, we're at you know 40 million tons of, of CO2, only half of which is anthropogenic. So we've got to, <laughs> to meet these goals. We have to increase by 50 fold in in in, in less than a decade. Uh, that's that's quite a quite a challenge. Yeah, getting some small wins seems to make a lot of sense there. What what do you see currently as the biggest obstacle in in scaling the CO2 storage, as, as you've talked about? These are some pretty audacious goals that you all are trying to meet. Well, I think there are three uh, impediments. Safety, which takes a lot of site characterization and a lot of study to know what can be done at scale that's safe. Scale is another, and, you know, it, it, it's a... You know, we have to be on a path that acknowledges the scale. So, for example, there's a very interesting project in the North Sea going on right now called Northern Lights. A number of major oil companies are part of it. An offshore reservoir is going to be used for CO2 that is collected by ship, uh, Norway, and Sweden, and perhaps other countries, and then um, be transported to this reservoir. This is a perfectly good project, um, and I hope it's successful. But the goal of that project is to be storing 1.4 million tons of CO2 per year by 2024. Well, you know, when we're talking about decarbonization, no idea is a bad idea. <laughs> you know, everything we can do to decarbonize is a step in the right direction, and this project is an example of that. There's nothing wrong with this project. I hope it goes ahead. I hope it's su successful. But it doesn't really put a dent in where we have to be by, by 2030. So scale is just this huge issue. So safety is an issue, identifying projects at scale. And then the third issue is economics. You know, right now there are limited incentives. There are some incentives. There's a, pr a small price on carbon in Europe. It needs to be higher. But in the U.S., um, which I know better, of course, there's what's called a 45Q. 45Q is a federal tax credit. Depending on how the CO2 is used when it's injected, it's, it's in the range of about $40 a ton uh, for CO2. That is not enough, really, to pay for the process. And so while there are some activities going on, they're relatively limited. California has a an incentive called LCFS, the Low Carbon Fuel Standard. It's it's more generous, and if you're say injecting CO2 in a manner that benefits low carbon transportation systems, then you qualify for that benefit as well. Um, and that and that's a better incentive, uh, more of an incentive. But California is you know just a, you know one of fifty states, and we have a geologically limited number of places that are um, you know safe to store CO2. There's certainly pl places in California that will be safe. But nonetheless, the incentives are, are not enough. So you know the real issue is what you know how do we turn the corner? Well these three things have to align. We have to have really big projects, they have to be safe and they have to be economic. And and those are you know those are three, uh, you know, each each of those three domains has has their own issues, but uh, hopefully uh, it will all be addressed. It's almost probably impossible to answer in a way. If you could kind of set aside those three impediments, that safety, the scale and economics of, of scaling the CO2 storage, what do you think kind of next is most essential to unlocking the long-term CO2 storage? Well, I, I don't think you can set those things aside. Those are the issues, you know, uh, to identify for safety, for example, we have to do characterization and characterization at a massive scale. OK, um, there, you know, there have been estimates of how much uh, pore space is available, say, from uh, 
saline aquifers in North America. And the, and the numbers are based on an estimate of the volume of pores in these sedimentary units where CO2 might be injected. But these volumetric estimates of pore space are really not anything more than, than that. It's a starting point. Okay, You need the pore space, obviously. But there's already saline brine in that pore space. So you can look at this from a, a fluid flow per, per perspective. You know, how much CO2 can we you know, inject into this already occupied pore space? And some of the estimates, you know, are, you know, on the order of, of t a tenth of the volumetric estimate or even less. So the amount of pore space um, that you you know is not a measure of how much you can inject, and and so very serious site characterization work needs to be done, and a lot of that work is uh, oh it's kind of analogous to uh, you know studying a potential oil and gas field. You know you got to do three D seismic, you've got to drill wells, you've got to study the formation properties, you've got to understand. You know uh, the physical properties, the hydrologic properties, uh, the geomechanics. It's all it's all right there. So characterization has to come first, and that characterization even is true of depleted oil and gas reservoirs. Uh, to come back to what I said before, we have to understand, you know, where that reservoir started, its physical properties, pore pressure, state of stress, and how all of that has evolved during. Uh, the production cycle over you know multiple decades, and so characterization is is really in every context has to occur at a very big scale, and it has to occur very soon. Who's going to pay for this characterization? Well, that that brings you back to these uh, economic incentives, and our taxpayers going to pay for it all? Well, um, they're certainly willing to pay for decarbonization at, at some scale. The federal tax credit reflects that. The LCFS in California reflects that. But you know, how are the economics going to work? And so it's a it's a really uh, it's a complex question of uh, societal priorities, government policies, and industry being available to you know work in that framework and carry out the task. Because in the end, this is going to be done by private industry. And in that regard, you know, represents a tremendous opportunity for private industry, you know, to be to be seen in the eyes of the public as being part of the solution and not just part of the problem. Yeah, that's kind of a great lead into this next question. If you could share this information presented in your talk with a CEO of an oil and gas company or or otherwise, or a lawmaker which would you choose and why? Well, I wouldn't choose uh, who I talk to. I think everybody needs to be be spoken to uh, in this uh, discussion. You know, we're talking about, you know, when you're talking about storing 6 billion tons of CO2 in the subsurface by 2050, you're talking about a volume of fluid that's one and a half times the amount of oil that is produced, transported, you know, refined, distributed, you know, we're talking about, what, a million producing wells around the world. We're talking about something like 3 million kilometers of pipelines. We're talking about tens of thousands of facilities. So it's one thing to say the words uh, 6 billion tons of CO2, you know, per year by 2050. It's another thing to actually translate that into an industrial process which is then one and a half times the uh, size of the of the global oil industry, which I um, I just described to you. This is a tremendous challenge, and so for the oil and gas executives, what I would tell them is that a simplistic view of decarbonization is everything is the oil company's fault. If we just stop producing oil, you know, the climate problem will go away. Well, that's ridiculous. It's so naive, it, it, it's, not almost, it's almost not worth commenting on. We have no way to store energy from wind and solar. Decarbonization of a number of industrial sectors, heavy-duty transportation, aviation is going to be an extremely difficult thing to do. Hydrogen has great promise, but we don't know how to produce hydrogen at scale without using methane and without producing a big CO2 uh, uh, problem. We, you know, we don't have 
uh, immediate pathways to decarbonization. So the oil and gas industry is going to be around for decades to come. But the only way out of the climate problem is to decarbonize the energy industry over the next half decade. And so where is the oil industry going to be during this next half decade? Fighting tooth and nail to hold on to what they have, to insist that these problems can be put off indefinitely into the future? I, I think not. I don't think that's a good strategy. I think a good strategy is for companies to evolve into companies that are both producing the oil and gas that is you know, that's going to be, continue to be needed and to be working very hard on the on the carbon sequestration issue it's going to take decades to scale up it's going to take decades to be you know storing enough carbon for the rest of the energy system you know to catch up large scale carbon capture and storage is not sustainable it's something we have to do for the next few decades while the energy system gets decarbonized uh, but that's going to you know that's going to be a long and difficult process so what I would tell CEOs is, is to envision this this you know the, this new role that the companies are playing. Yes, they they continue to be oil and gas companies, but yes, they're playing a major role in CCS and decarbonization efforts. And the government officials who need to be spoken to have to understand that this is going to be a long and challenging process, and we have to have policies in place. We have to have incentives in place to allow this to happen because unless it makes sense it's not going to happen and you know in the end um, the oil and gas industry has to carry this out they're the right people to do it they have all the skills knowledge and capabilities to do it but the stars have to align and uh, all these different sectors have to work together to, to meet the, uh, the the tremendous uh, challenge of climate change and the tremendous ta task of decarbonizing our energy industry well, this lecture is a great place to start or uh, to continue this long and challenging process ahead. Kind of want to end with this last, more general question. What one piece of advice would you offer someone that would like to succeed in your field? I think it's a tremendously important role for the geosciences as we go forward. And by geosciences, I mean geology, geophysics, um, reservoir engineering. I, you know, I, I, I refer to the geosciences uh, broadly. We have the continued need to produce um, oil and gas in the most efficient ways possible. And we have this enormous issue of using uh, the subsurface for, for storing for storing carbon. And that is, um, it's going to take uh, you know, several generations to see through to the end. And so you know, people th see this as the uh, twilight of the uh, oil and gas industry. I think that's a uh, <laughs> highly highly overblown. The oil and gas industry will continue to be a critically important one and will be even more important by embracing the challenge of decarbonization as well as continuing to produce oil and gas. So I'm very, I'm very optimistic. I think we need a, um, you know, a whole new generation of uh, bright, hardworking geoscientists, uh, you know, to keep the industry uh, vibrant and to move the industry into into new areas. And uh, I I hope people don't shy away from this, you know, by taking this short term view. It's going to be a long haul. But, um, you know, if we stay the course, uh, we'll, we'll get there. Mark, I appreciate you taking time to talk a little more in depth about your lecture and uh, good luck on the big challenges ahead. Well, thank you. I've, I've enjoyed speaking with you and uh, uh, I look forward to working you know, with the uh, SEG community uh, as we, we, we take on these challenges. Thank you for listening to SEG's flagship podcast, Seismic Sound Off. SEG produces these episodes to benefit its members, the geophysics community, and inform the public on the value of the science. To show your support for the show, please share this episode with a friend, colleague, or manager that would enjoy hearing this show. Your recommendation is the single best action you can take on behalf of SEG's podcast. To receive the latest episodes first, follow Seismic Sound Off on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Podcasts. The SEG podcast team is Ted Bakamjan, Kathy Gamble, and Ali McGinnis. Thank you for listening. This is Seismic Sound Off. 
signaling off.